without any further ado, let's talk about what we can do with the ranking cycle. And here's an example of what you can do with the ranking cycle. Um, it doesn't have four state points anymore, now it's got nine, so it's bigger. Uh, there's a few things in it, like the closed feed water heater is a, becomes a heat exchanger. Um, that's our only new component, we've got two pumps instead of one. So we're going to talk about why we do that and how it changes our analysis. So first of all, I just want to re-mention the basic cycle. I want to talk about what we can do to improve the efficiency of just the basic cycle. So without adding any more components, what are some of the things we can do to get a better thermal efficiency? And then reintroduce, okay, well, what if we reheat the fluid and we look at the reheaters in the Brayton cycle? And then what if we split the flow? And this is an example of split flow. So we've taken a takeoff from the turbine partway through. What does that do to our efficiency? And then putting it all together, we've got a problem that I'd like you to solve in groups as, as discussed. So that's the plan for this morning. Excellent. Are there any questions at this stage before we begin? Wonderful. So this is the problem that we want to be able to solve. And this is representative of our test type question. Now, last year it was a closed feed water heater. But this was, a, this was the question for last year's exam. It used a closed feed water heater on an advanced ranking cycle rather than an open feed water heater. Um, but it's, it, this is kind of representative of what I expect it would take you an hour to an hour and 10 minutes to solve. Um, we have a two hour exam, so I kind of have to think about that sort of thing. And it says, consider a steam power plant operating on a Rankine cycle with regeneration in an open feed water heater. So regeneration is a new word for us. Open feed water heater is a new con like a um, component. So we'll look at that. Some mass flow of steam enters the turbine at a pressure and temperature. The condenser is out of pressure. And the bleed, state four, um, steam's bled off at a pressure. So you're given a couple of variables. Uh, you've given some states, they're saturated liquids and so forth. Complete a table of properties, which would be our first thing when we're dealing with cycles. And then we're going to calculate a whole series of secondary outputs. Um, and so that's what I've got you doing. So this is the question we want to be able to solve. So we need to know what's an open feed water heater. How do we calculate work out of a turbine when it's got two offtakes? Because that's a new thing. We've been using turbines with one mass flow all the way through them. So we need to think about that. Uh, and what does it do to our efficiency anyway? So that's where we're going. But first of all, there must be things we can do for a basic ranking cycle. This is your basic ranking cycle to improve its efficiency. So what are some things we can do here? Basic ranking cycle, four components. A pump to increase the pressure of the liquid. A boiler to add heat to the liquid and take it into the superheated uh, region. A turbine to get out as much work as we can hopefully as close to isentropic as we can, and then you're left with some residual heat that you need to get out in the condenser to take you back to a, a fully liquid state so you can run it through a pump. If you don't take the heat out, your pump would have to become a compressor and you'd find you'd get no network from the system. So those are the four components you need to get a basic Rankine cycle working. And we can calculate the work through the basic Rankine cycle. So this, I'm speaking quickly because it's review work, hopefully. And our ideal four, four ideal processes would be isentropic compression through the pump, isobaric heat addition through the boiler, isentropic expansion through the turbine, and isobaric heat rejection through the condenser. So there would be our four processes, and we can calculate the work and the heat required over there on the right with an alternative calculation for the pump because working in the compressed liquid region, often that top calculation is a little bit... Um, either requires interpolation or is a bit inaccurate. So we can use this term in the bottom left-hand corner instead. So the question that we asked ourselves for the basic Rankine cycle was this one. And we calculated our state points and got a thermal efficiency. So this is a review of the first time we looked at the Rankine cycle. We got a thermal efficiency of 28.4%. And I've drawn a TS diagram because I think it's helpful and we will talk about TS diagrams more today because it's a visual way of trying to work out how to improve this cycle. So we've taken a saturated fluid and we've added pressure isentropically. So S hasn't changed. Temperatures may be risen a little bit, but really not very much. We've followed that high pressure line up until it's boiled. We've superheated it. 
run it through a turbine from state three to four, and then recondensed it from state one to two. <clears throat> For our interest, the Carnot cycle efficiency, so the second law efficiency, sorry, if this was a Carnot cycle operating between those temperatures, so there's a low temperature of 93 degrees and a high temperature of 350 degrees, a Carnot cycle operating between those would have a thermal efficiency of 50%. And so 28% versus 50%, so we're 57% of the way towards a Carnot cycle, which I propose is not very efficient. I propose we should do better with our thermal efficiency for this cycle. So how are we going to do that? Something cool about TS diagrams, and it works as well for PV diagrams, although we'll often represent these on TS diagrams, is we can analyze them visually, or we can use visual means to quickly ascertain where are we going with our efficiency. So because thermal efficiency is Q in minus Q out, or Q net, and Q net equals work net, for a closed uh, cycle. So it's work net divided by Q in. Our Q net, or our work net, is the area of this green region here. Okay? Because our Q in is the area under this line, and our Q out is the area under that line. So if I take those two away from one another, I get the green region. So that's our work net for the cycle. And our Q in is the total area under this line. So it's our green region plus our red region. And so we can think of thermal efficiency. And this, you know, the scale on left is in degrees C. So you're like, aha, shift the scale on left, the red region goes away. Not that simple, but. <laughs> You know, if the scale on the left was in Kelvin, then those areas would be appropriate. And so we can see, well, what can we do to either increase the region, the green region, while decreasing the red or not increasing the red by as much uh, is kind of a visual indicator for us. This only works for reversible processes. So if we had a, a turbine that wasn't isentropic, for example, we know that we would go from state 3.3 out to state point four dash, and you would say, aha, I have increased the area of green and possibly not increased the area of red by as much, but in fact, that increased area of green isn't working for you because you don't get that out as work out of the turbine. So it only works for reversible processes, um, but it's a nice little suck of the thumb guide as to what's your process doing? Is it improving efficiency? or decreasing efficiency. So, based on just a Carnot cycle understanding of thermodynamics, you could say, well, there's a couple of things we could do to improve the efficiency. One is, take the high temperature and increase it. Now, there is take the low temperature and decrease it. That'll give us, that would give a Carnot cycle a higher efficiency. And so, therefore, if we're working on the same second law kind of principles, our thermal efficiency should go up for the system. So raising the high temperature or lowering the cold temperature are things we can do to make our process more efficient. When we condense our fluid, so we're condensing at the moment, this cycle condensed at 80 kilopascals, so lower than atmospheric pressure. And because one of our assumptions we make is that the fluid coming out of the condenser is a saturated liquid, we can see that at 80 kilopascals, we have a low temperature of 93.5 degrees. And unless we subcool our liquid, which wouldn't actually help in this case, um, that's our lower bound temperature. And the way to get lower temperatures for our car efficiency would reduce the, the cold temperature, increase the hot temperature. The way to get lower temperatures would be to decrease the pressure in the condenser, and you can see here at pressures of uh, 10 kilopascals, 8 kilopascals, and so forth. Um, sorry? 10 kilopascals, yeah, 8. Yep, yeah, down to 2 kilopascals. You can see the temperature of condensation is reducing from almost 100 degrees down to 45 degrees, 30 degrees, 
and so forth. So we can reduce the cold temperature by making the condensation happen at a lower pressure. And that's a way that we can improve our thermal efficiency. There's limitations to this. Um, so it was Lord Kelvin who said you can't have a lower temperature in your thermodynamic cycle that's lower than the surrounding temperature. So if you're dealing with a lake and you're trying to evolve heat off into a lake or into the atmosphere or so forth, and you can only do that economically at around 40 degrees, well then there's no point trying to condense your fluid at these kind of pressures because you won't get saturated liquid out. You can't get rid of the heat uh, if your system's colder than your surroundings are. And the other problem is that working with extreme low pressures, you can get air leakage and air entrainment into your, um, into your water stream. So we've been assuming for our whole Rankine cycle that it's just H2O and it's very pure H2O. Uh, there's very low contaminants. Contaminants affect the boiling temperature of water and so forth. And if there's air, then you're gonna get cavitation. Um, goodness knows what's gonna happen in your turbine. And so air ingress is a problem in these low pressure parts of the system. And we can get rid of those. I'll, I'll talk about getting rid of those as well. The other thing that's not as obvious necessarily in looking at the table, but I think it comes out when we look at the, the TS diagram, is that as you lower the pressure of condensation on the TS diagram, your vapor dome goes kind of like that. Right. And so if you lower your pressure to here, you've got quite a high quality. If you lower your pressure and thereby by your temperature, sorry, this is temperature and energy. If you continue to lower your pressure and thereby your temperature, you can see your qualities come down quite a bit. And so that can be a problem for your turbine as well. So it tends to lower the quality of the turbine exit, which we need to keep high to operate our turbine efficiently. But what does that look like on a TS chart? So hopefully this notation makes sense. So one, two, three, four is our original cycle. And then one dash, two dash, three remains the same. So point three remains the same, and four dash. So we've lowered the pressure. In this case, I think I've lowered the pressure from 80 kilopascals to 10 kilopascals and thereby lowered the temperature at state point four dash, lowered the temperature at state point one dash. And we can see that we've increased the area of our green area. Green is good visually, you know, working on that. We've increased the area of our green area and probably decreased the area of our red. Remembering the rectangle comes down into the, down to the zero Kelvin, but we've managed to reduce its height. Maybe we've increased its width a little bit, but we've certainly improved our thermal efficiency by lowering our condensation pressure, lowering our condensation temperature. So that's a way we can improve the basic Rankine cycle. The other thought is, rather than just go to 350 degrees, can we go hotter at our high temperature? This is also from Carno. He says, well, if you have your, the hottest point in your cycle um, hotter, that'll improve your efficiency. So again, our turbine will define how hot we can do that. Uh, but the good news is this raises our turbine exit quality. So if lowering the condensation pressure um, causes problems, water droplets in our turbine, or well, raising the superheat temperature will improve our quality. And so same thing again, our original cycles are one, two, three, and four. And now we've increased our heat, our temperature, um, heat into the, into the boiler, we've raised our exit temperature, three dash and four dash. And you can see we've gotten, you get quite a bit of work out of that process. So I've been, and you know, arbitrarily high, it would be nice to think you could go to arbitrarily high temperatures, but there's obviously some limitations. Um, we're getting quite a bit of work out of that right hand side while increasing our heat rejection a little bit. So we can improve our thermal efficiency through those means. Another thing to consider or, or to think about is increasing the boiler pressure. And we'll have a look at what that does. So this does a few things. It increases the height. 
So we've gone to the same temperature here. So it's three dash and three. So I've said, okay, well, the temperature out of the boiler, let the temperature out of the boiler be 350 degrees. So I've kept that temperature the same and kept the condensation pressure the same. See, we've got a little bit of height, extra height. We've lost a bit of width, but we've got less condensation um, heat loss in our condenser. So this is something that, depending on the pressures and temperatures you're talking about, can cause an improvement in thermal efficiency or a decrease in thermal efficiency, but it does let you do something which is reheat the fluid then, which is the next thing we'll talk about. So the idea is we can manipulate some of the variables. When you're talking about the Brayton cycle, it's a little bit simpler. We talk about just gas temperatures and so forth. You don't have this vapor dome to deal with, which really does manipulate. So this, this boiling of water really controls what your cycle looks like in the TS space. So that's all four component, four processes, four state points, the things you can do. Let's talk about introducing another component, some more state points. What does that look like and how can it improve what we're doing? So one of the things we can do is, after we come out of our boiler and go into our turbine, rather than just have a turbine with one exit, so you've got one mass flow, rather than just going all the way through the turbine and out to our condenser, we can go through a portion of a turbine, and these can be two turbines, so sometimes this is drawn with a high pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine. And the idea is you'll come into the high pressure turbine, into the low pressure turbine and out. All right. Here it's drawn as one turbine with an outlet, sorry, an outlet and an inlet. Okay. So the idea is rather than go all the way down to whatever your final pressure is going to be, come down some of the pressure, take it back to the boiler and reheat that fluid then up to potentially the same temperature as before or a different temperature, lower or higher. Take it back to the reheater, so at a medium pressure, then bring it back into the turbine and run it through the remainder of the turbine. Then condense the fluid, take it to a pump and back to the steam generator. This mitigates against our concern. So our concern of dealing with higher pressures was, so just going from one to two, up to three, and then back down to this state point here. Our concern with dealing with higher pressures was that we get low quality in our turbine output. Here we can control that by controlling where we take off the, the fluid, or what pressure we take off the fluid at state point four. You can see here state point four is still superheated then at a constant pressure, add temperature again, add heat to take you back up to, in this case, the same temperature. So three and five have the same temperature and then condense. And our quality at state point six can be quite high now using multi-stage reheating or multi-stage turbines. So this is, I've increased my initial pressure to 15 megapascals, which would give me a quality of that looks like 77%, which would be unacceptable for a real turbine. Right? But by coming to a medium pressure of three megapascals, I can come down to a, a condenser pressure of 10 kilopascals, so quite low at 10 kilopascals, and still get above 90% as my turbine quality at the end. So how do we analyze this mathematically? Well, we say that the Q in That's not Q net, that's Q in. My apologies, Q net would have to take into account the condenser as well, sorry. That Q in will be whatever you put in as heat in the steam generator, the boiler initially, plus whatever heat you add in the reheater. So you have to take both of those heats into account, which is just the enthalpy of the state points before and after the reheater and before and after the steam generator. So three and two and five and four. So I've gone back a slide 
So between two and three, we've gone through the steam generator. Between four and five, we've gone through the reheater. And our overall work for the turbine, we've only got one mass flow, which is nice. So you take all of the mass through the low pressure turbine or the high pressure turbine, reheat it all, take all of the mass through the low pressure turbine. And so we only get one work term. I'm, I'm implying that we're gonna have split flow soon. And so the work from our turbine is the work from turbine one plus the work from turbine two, which is the enthalpy change from three to four plus the enthalpy change from five to six. So again, going back, so from three to four is your high pressure turbine and from five to six is your low pressure turbine. So it's something we can do. We added a component, we added two state points. The analysis is a little bit more complicated, but hopefully you can see that we've got quite a large green area. If we said, you know, green area is good and green plus red is um, the bad so forth, red is bad. You can see we've increased our green area considerably while reducing our red area and maintaining our turbine quality. So this is something you would want to do. And this is something that is done in practice. Any questions at that stage? Yeah, go. How many turbines would, like, would you have to stop at? If you could yep. keep making it efficient by putting multiple, like three or four. Yep. Like at what point does it get? The question is how many turbines would you have to stop at? You could work that out. You could have a look at that. Um, I'm going to say three in a row would probably be enough. Because if we, if we manipulated this properly, and we brought state point four down to 200 degrees C, all right, so what's the pressure at that is 15 bar, somewhere between 15 and 20 bar, so two megapascals. So rather than three megapascals now, sorry, I know what all the numbers on the chart mean. Um, I'm looking at these numbers here. This is a pressure number. So if we brought that down to say one and a half megapascals instead of three megapascals, then that would come out a fair way. You can only go infinitely far to the right if you can reduce your pressure to an infinite degree, and you can't because of air leakage problems and so forth. Um, yeah, I would suggest in this case, two turbines, maybe if you increase your, your pressure above 15 megapascals, uh, maybe three turbines. What, there'd, be, there'd be something in the, in the last turbine. Yeah, it's a good question. Any other thoughts on reheating? Cool. So the analysis isn't, the analysis is more complex, but it's not indefinitely more complex. Heat in is the sum of the heats in, work out is the sum of the works out. And work out is just your turbines, as we know, and heat in is your boilers. We've done that before. When I had, when I had a kettle on the stage, with no control infrastructure at all, I could turn that kettle on, and when the water was boiling, I knew the temperature of the water, and I knew the temperature of the steam coming off. So if for a saturated state, I could almost open, open loop it. You guys haven't done control theory yet. That's okay. Um, I could just pump heat in the, into the thing. And as long as there was both a liquid and a vapor phase, um, I knew what the temperature was. So really easy to control, really easy to achieve, saturated states. Same with a condenser. If you're running a condenser at a, at a known pressure and there's some liquid in the bottom and there's something on top of it, there's a vapor phase on top, you know what the temperature is. Um, quite easy to achieve. If you're using, uh, if you're doing a refrigeration or air conditioning unit for your assignment, you might have come with a question, you've probably found the pressures from the manufacturer um, specification, but you might have asked yourself the question, how do I know whether the liquid is condensed liquid, saturated condensed liquid, or subcooled liquid? Or how do I know if the vapor state is superheated or whether it's saturated? And it's harder to deal with. Right? So it's, um, it becomes more complicated when you're dealing with superheat and subcooled regions. This is Reissel's diagram, P, um, process and flow diagram, example of achieving a superheated steam. So we're going to just deal with it in a box. We say 
This is your steam generator and it achieves this temperature. It reheats, goes to the same temperature. Excellent, good. So that's how we're gonna uh, treat things. But there's some infrastructure inside of it that's worth being aware of. So here's a steam drum and there's some liquid in it and some steam in it. So you know that the output from that is saturated steam. So that's kind of nice. It's having, it's having liquid come down a downcomer, down to a header. A header is a, um, a header is a pipe with lots of offtakes. Okay, so it's coming down, possibly probably a big pipe down the middle, and then being distributed into a header, and then all of the offtakes are coming back up, and that's drawing heat energy out of the air here. Right, we're burning, we're burning fuel and putting hot air into this unit. That's drawing heat energy out of the air and it's heating up the water. What's causing the water to flow? I can't see any pumps. What's causing the water to go down the downcomer and go up the risers here? Gravity, right? So the, the implication is that the water in the risers is warmer than the water in the downcomer. And so as it's rising, it's got a lower density, so it's drawing up and drawing new water down the downcomer. So that's to achieve saturated steam. Now the question is, what do we do with that? Well, in this case, they've taken it into a superheater, so they're running it through pipes, exposing it to more hot air again, and trying to achieve that superheated temperature, whatever temperature is being desired. And so obviously you'd have some geometrical concerns related heat transfer. What is the superheater going to look like? It's gone off to a high pressure turbine. So this is for the system we've just looked at. It's gone off to a high pressure turbine. It's um, returned from the high pressure turbine to go back to the low pressure turbine. And in this case, so that's all at that hot temperature, maybe 500 degrees or so forth, like that, that highest temperature we're trying to achieve. We don't want to exhaust the hot air at 500 degrees C because that is a waste of energy. So there's a few things that they've done here. One is an economizer. So we've taken our cold water in and you're not going to achieve that superheat type temperature, but you'll get some of the energy. You get some of the thermal energy out of the flue gas that's otherwise leaving. So you're going to preheat your water before taking it into the drum. And then the other thing they're doing here is taking the, taking the incoming air through and preheating the incoming air. So here you're dealing with air and air, right? But the thought is if you can preheat your incoming air by 100 degrees, so rather than drawing it in at 20 degrees, you're drawing it at 120 degrees, then that's fuel you don't have to burn at the base. So if you can, if you can cool your stack gas down as much as possible, you want the coldest air leaving the stack as you can get um, by drawing all of the energy out. So you can get some complicated arrangements um, to try and achieve those superheated states. Cool. Here's something else we can do. So the, the process flow diagram in the bottom right kind of shows it, right? Now we've got a turbine with two offtakes, but we've done something a little bit different, okay? So from our boiler, We've gone into our turbine, we've run down some of the pressure, so maybe from our 15 megapascals down to our three megapascals, which is what we did before. And then we've taken off a flow and we're gonna take that into an open feed water heater, which is like just a large tank with two inlets and one outlet. There's a large open tank, just think of a large vacant open space. It's got some water in the bottom, it's a um, saturated liquid and it's got a saturated vapor above it. So it's got some liquid level in it. I think this arrow is confusing. All right, so we've taken off some feed at a lower pressure, and then we've taken the rest of the fluid down to the pressure of state five, so down to the condenser pressure, 80 kilopascals, 10 kilopascals, is what we've been talking about. Out of our condenser, then, we've come into a pump, well, that's what you'd expect. But because the open feed water heater is a large open tank, it has no pressure 
difference between the three inlets. Okay? So if we take this, this off at three megapascals, we can't get our pump to take us all the way up to 15 megapascals, like we might have liked. This pump can only take us up to three megapascals, and assuming an isobaric process, state point one is then three megapascals as well. Then we need a second pump to achieve, say, our 15 megapascals into our boiler. How's that going for you from a process flow? So we've got a massive steam entering the turbine, here denoted MT, or just M dot, so that's our mass flow rate. And we're taking some fraction, so A will be a number between zero and one, taking some mass fraction off into our open feed water heater. And then the rest, so one minus A here, the rest will flow through the condenser and off to the pumps. The benefit of this is that heat lost in the condenser, so the only Q out in the system, assuming everything else is adiabatic and isentropic and so forth, the only heat out of the system is heat that you lose through the condenser. And thermal efficiency is one minus heat in divided by, doesn't sound right, one minus heat out divided by heat in. Does that sound right? Yes? So if you can reduce your heat out, Sorry, I should write that. One minus, you've got more coming, shocking. Thank you, good. Right, so if you could reduce your heat out, your thermal efficiency approaches one. So if you can have no heat loss from the system, your thermal efficiency approaches one. By reducing the amount of mass flow that's flowing through the condenser, here, then you can reduce your heat out going between that um, whatever state you, you leave at your turbine and whatever state you come out at point six. So you're getting some work through your turbine in this cycle between state two, three, four, and one. Right? You've got a little cycle going on there that has no heat loss. It's got heat in, it's got work out of the turbine, and then it goes back to the pump, and you can imagine that A M dot fluid is just going around that cycle perfectly efficiently. And then the heat that's leaving your system is coming through five, six, and seven. Would QSG, yes, so you reduce your... Yep. Yes. Exactly. So state six is a saturated liquid and state one is a saturated liquid, but because state one's a higher pressure, state one is a lot higher temperature than state six can be and still run through a pump. And you're getting that thermal energy from your steam. So you're taking thermal energy from your steam, which means you can reduce the heat in from the boiler, absolutely, yeah. You can't do this, um, you say, well, why have the condenser and, and pump on the right-hand side at all? Why not just run it through the cycle on the left? That sounds like a great idea. And it turns out that you can't do that. Heat has to leave the system at some point. And you can imagine there would be some optimal flow there'd be some optimal value for A for this system. Uh, it turns out that it's about the pressure offtake, four, pressure four, should be about a third of what pressure three is, um, is what it turns out to be. Because obviously if you move the pressure down close to the condenser pressure, then your open feed water heater can only operate at a, at a low pressure. And so therefore your pressure of one isn't high enough to allow that, um, that temperature rise to be considerable. Right? If you off -take, take straight away, so state point three is at 15 megapascal, off take at 12 megapascal, then you don't get much energy out um, 
from the left-hand side of the system. So there's an optimal pressure at which you need to offtake here. And you assume that state point six and state point one are saturated. So that's the assumption from that. This pressure limitation, so this having an open feed water heater and the idea that, okay, well maybe we want to reduce the pressure in the turbine, but that would reduce our pressure at state point one and so we've got to find some system that works for our open, open feed water heater. We can get around that by having the two fl fluid streams not interact. So rather than having one large tank container. Uh, hang on, sorry, what's some comments on that? Improve thermal efficiency, good. Decrease total output. It may not be obvious, but you're actually getting less work out of the turbine. In this case, you're not taking all your fluid from state point three to five, you're taking some off. But you decrease your steam generator um, heating as well. And it turns out that you get a higher thermal efficiency by doing those things. The turbine's physically larger and we've added another pump. So we've added a little bit more infrastructure to our system. We can get around, this is what I want to say, we can get around the idea of having that, that open feed water heater at a certain pressure by having a closed feed water heater instead. So the two systems on the right use a closed feed water heater, which is a heat exchanger. So in this case, you've got fluid set four going through to fluid seven, and that's losing some thermal energy to the water going from state point one to state point two. So what's lost in thermal energy from four to seven is gained in thermal energy from one to two, assuming an adiabatic heat exchanger. Here you can see you've only got one pump creating pressure so that pump's taking it all the way up to your 15 megapascals. You're not leaving state point two as a saturated liquid. It's still going to be a compressed liquid in that case. And you have to know, well, how much energy you're getting out. You can assume state point seven is saturated liquid. So you say the steam run comes through and state point seven is a saturated liquid, but possibly still at three megapascals. We allow three megapascals to be our bleed off. So now what do you do? So you've run state point four state through to state point seven. We've reduced our thermal energy. We've come out as a condensed or as a saturated liquid at say three megapascals. Now we've got some options as to what to do with this fluid, right? So we've got some mass flow of fluid. There's two thoughts of what we can do. One is it's at three megapascals, so we need to throttle it in order to reduce the pressure and bring it back to a condenser. So just waste it back into the condenser and the condenser will convert that back to saturated liquid at a lower pressure to go back through the cycle. Or the other thing we can do is we've still got some thermal energy that we want to use. So we pump it up to whatever our steam generator pressure is and add it to the fluid flow. So in this case, state um, 0.2 and 8 are combining together to state 0.9 and it's going into the steam generator. How much you want to recover the thermal energy in state point seven, and how much you think a pump or a throttle would cost would determine which system you'd go with. So it's another way of recovering thermal energy, getting less out of the condenser, recovering thermal energy, improving our thermal efficiency. And you can do a couple of these. You can do a reheater and a regenerator and a this and a that and so forth and get quite large systems. So what does that look like when we do it? Here's an open feed water heater. Um, you can see you've got a top cycle going around, one, two, three, four, and then the lower pressure cycle as well. I'm running out of time. But I'll... I'll talk through this one, the work of the turbine, because it's worth knowing and because it's used in your calculation, and then we're going to have a break. So, same with the high pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine, our turbine work is the sum of work between our two turbine states, turbine one and turbine two. The work through turbine one is between state point three and state point four, and all the mass flow goes through those two points. So this is before the flow is split, 
So you get a H3 minus H4 for that portion of the turbine. Then some of the fluid goes between state point 4 and state point 5, and it is 1 minus A times the total mass flow. And so we get 1 minus A being the mass flow rate times state point 4 and state point 5. So we calculate the work through our turbine by splitting up the two portions and saying, well, some of it gets this all the mass flow and some gets a portion of the mass flow. For our two pumps, we get the same thing. So for pump one, in this case I've denoted this pump one, we only get a portion of the mass flow through pump one times the difference in the enthalpies. And for pump two, we get the whole mass flow times the difference in the enthalpies. So that's our work for our turbine and our work for our pump. The steam generator is fairly simple in this case. We don't have a reheater. So it's just the difference in enthalpies between state point two and state point three. So when you split your flow, you look confused. When you split your flow, you need to say how much mass is available to drive the turbine, or for your pump, how much mass do I need to drive using this pump? And it's not all of it, um, so it's something to be taken into consideration. So now we've added a few components. We've got our, our four normal components. We've added a reheater, which is the same as a boiler, but just needs to be taken into consideration. And we've added two heat exchangers, an open feed water heater and a closed feed water heater. A closed feed water heater is going to be operating at two different pressures for the same fluid stream. And indeed, all of this is about reducing the heat out of the condenser to bring our thermal efficiency closer to one, closer to that optimal um, process. What you'll find when you're doing calculations is you'll find pressure and temperature and quality, particularly saturated steam and saturated liquid, are the things you can easily measure. You can observe those in the field. Put a pressure gauge, read the pressure. Put a thermocouple, read the temperature. They're the things that can be most easily observed, and so they're most commonly given in problems. We'll find that enthalpy and entropy, which are, I would posit, impossible to measure. You don't get an enthalpy gauge, you get a pressure gauge. So those are the things you need to calculate, but they're the things that you use to determine your heat through your boiler, work through your turbine, work in the pump, and so forth. So you'll be, in general, you will be given pressure, temperature, and maybe quality, or some other sorts of things, and you'll need to determine H and S, and then use those to answer the questions. So this is now our question, uh, and I will freeze that question. Freeze. Oh, I'm, no, I won't freeze that. Sorry. Quick, so because looking up state points takes a while, I've done it for you. I want you to focus on the calculations for this session, right? So complete a table of properties. I've put in purple, purple's for me. Ah, the figure hasn't come through, I apologize. But we're given a bunch of pressures and state points. So that gives us a state table as filled out in the bottom left. There's three states that have got two independent intrinsic properties and there they are. So I can fill out the H and S values for those. Then I can exploit the fact that I had a turbine and two pumps and they're all isentropic to know that the S's have to be the same, so I can fill those out. And then I can use the two independent intrinsic properties to fill out the rest of the H values to give me all of the enthalpies. Sorry about the figure not coming through on the right. Hopefully it does. No. All right, I will work that out because I think it's important to know what each of the state points refers to. So I'll, I'll fix that up in the break. That one? Excellent. Cool, part two. Let's talk about it. So flow rate, the flow of water bled from the turbine, which is directed to the feed water heater, is going to be some proportion of the total flow. So the total flow is 90 kilograms per second. Right? People are doing calculations on work. People are doing calculations on heat. Um, there, there's no, the open feed water heater produces no work. It has no shaft from which to produce work. And ideally, in an ideal case, it would be adiabatic. 
So we'd only have heat transfer in our steam generator and in our condenser. So let's talk about what we would do here. So what we want is the first law. It's our first law of thermodynamics, which is heat minus work plus flow in minus flow out equals change in energy of the system. All right. So let's write that up. Heat minus work plus uh, I mass in times H in minus summation of, let's call it J, mass out, H out, equals the change in energy in the system, D energy over time. The operation is occurring at a steady state, you know, steady state, steady flow system. So there's no change in energy in the system over time. So that's our first law for this process. Good, it is coming up on the screen. That's our first law for this process. If we say that the heat exchanger here is adiabatic and performs no boundary work, because the boundaries don't move, it's a tank, all right, then we get that the sum of mass flow rates in times the enthalpy is in minus the sum of mass flow rates out times the enthalpy out must equal zero. Now, what are the flow rates in? We've got some flow coming in from state point four and some flow coming in from state point seven. Okay, so this says mass flow rate four. Oh, sorry, these should have derivatives on top of them. Mass flow rate four plus mass flow rate seven. Oops. For enthalpy four plus mass flow rate seven, enthalpy seven must equal, I've taken the outs to the other side of the equation, mass flow rate one, enthalpy one. And indeed, you have an expression for the mass flow rate at four, and that's A. So you can divide throughout by M dot, and you get AH4 plus one minus A H7 equals all of the mass flow rate goes through state point one equals H1. You've got H4, you've got H7, you've got H1, you've got one equation with one unknown, solve for A. Cool, carry on. Thanks guys, thanks for, um, thanks for playing the game with that. I'll just do a little bit of a lecture wrap up on the next thing that caused confusion for people. And then we will call it a day. Um, I think I've got a little bit of inspiration about what to do tomorrow as well. All right. Ah, oh, Alex is so popular. Out you go. Off you go. I'm lecturing now. Ready go. Hush. No more answering questions. Ready go. Cool. So the other I guess, you know, it kind of makes sense by the ordering of the questions. Um, people got stuck on question two, but I'm really glad that you got stuck here and we got to address it together. Because that's a real, like, linchpin. If you don't do that, well, what are you going to do for the rest of the problem? So I'm glad we got to get stuck on there and work together through that one. The condenser was then relatively easy. You just had to take in the fractional mass through the condenser. The next question people got stuck on was question four, work through the turbine. And so I wanted to talk about work through the turbine from two perspectives. Come back to it in 10 minutes time. Let's, let's talk and we'll, we'll come back in 10 minutes time. There's two perspectives through the turbine that I thought, there's two ways of calculating it and maybe one will be can easily concept, more easily conceptually than the other. So let's do that. The first thing I'll do is come back to that image. Cool. You can see here, if I draw there, excellent. You can see here there's some flow coming out of state point four, and then some of it's redirecting back in, and some's going to the open feed water heater. Conceptually, you could say, all right, if it's easier for you to deal with, that there's two turbines here on a common shaft. There's a high pressure turbine on the left hand side and a low pressure turbine on the right hand side. And so all of the mass flows into the high pressure turbine, all the mass flows out of the high pressure turbine. 
Some of the mass flows into the low pressure turbine, which also flows out then, so that goes around and flows out. And then some fraction of mass flows through the open feed water heater and we calculated what that portion was. All right. In that case, the work out of the turbine is made up of two components. The work you get from the high pressure side of the turbine plus the work you get from the low pressure side of the turbine. Okay? And so our work through the turbine will be the work through the high pressure side. Hopefully, you're happy with the idea that that's m dot delta h. So that would be h3 minus h4. So that would be our high pressure work from the turbine. And then you've get, got some work out of the low pressure side of the turbine. Now, not the whole mass flow goes through there. Only 1 minus A times the mass flow goes through there. 1 minus A, M dot, goes through that portion of the turbine. And indeed, the difference in enthalpies here is H4 minus H5. So your total turbine work must be the sum of your two, in this case, two turbines, right? Worth of work. And of course, mass flow A, which is about 31%, of your, um, of your fluid doesn't get to do any work between 4 megapascals and 12 kPa because it's already been redirected to your open feed water heater. That's one way of looking at work through the turbine. If that works conceptually for you, that works conceptually for me because I think that fluid is, a certain mass of fluid is going between two enthalpies, that works for me. Another way you can think of doing this is going back to our first law, right, of Q dot minus W dot plus sum of masses in H in, sorry, that's a mass, minus sum of masses out H out, okay, equals change in energy over time. And because it's steady state, steady flow, so we can take our steady state, steady flow equation, we know that that's zero. There's no change in over time, in the time domain, um, of the energy in the system. Our ideal turbine will be adiabatic, so we can get rid of our Q term, and we just get a minus work down. Now this is interesting because this is treating it like our open feed water heater, but with a work term. So we've got our mass in. Mass in will be uh, the mass flow through state point three, which is mass T total. We've got two outs. We've got mass flow rate four and mass flow rate five. If you say sum goes down four and sum goes down five, all right? So we're gonna take our work term, we had a minus W on that side, we're gonna take it over this side and we're gonna say work is over here, work turbine work. What's our inlet mass? Well, that's gonna be our overall mass times H3. What are our two outlet masses? So minus A, times H4, because that's our mass we're losing in H4, minus one minus A out of H5 <clears throat> equals work turbine. Sorry that the equation's not very lined up. <clears throat> so another way that we could represent our work for our turbine is by saying, well, how much energy goes into the turbine, mass flow rate H3, and how much energy goes out of the turbine, A mass flow rate H4 and one minus A, um, sorry, I'm missing an M term there, my apologies. Mass flow rate H5, okay. If you have energy going in and energy coming out, the difference in those must be what comes out as work, assuming it's adiabatic, all right? And so that's a different way. You can just treat it as a black box. That's a minus sign. Just treat it with a black box with a work term. And you say, well, hang on a minute, because the equation at the top and the equation at the bottom are different equations. How can you say that the work is one or either of those things? And actually, you'll find that if you expand and simplify the top equation, you'll get the bottom equation. I use the top equation because I like to think what's happening with my mass and what is it interacting with. But the bottom equation works just as well. Take the first law, simplify out the things you don't have, leave in place the things you do have, and do the, the summation, and you'll get that. Um, 
I think that's pretty much where people were getting stuck, which makes sense because it's the newly introduced things. Open feed water heater and uh, a turbine with more than one outlet are the newly introduced things, this lecture. Hopefully, the rest are things that come out of the problem. I just, I put in question nine as a little bit of a, a thought-provoking, hopefully, a thought-provoking question of, okay, so we've bled off at four megapascals, all right? One can imagine if you bled off at 12 kilopascals down towards the condensation, you'd get not a gain in efficiency. One would imagine if you bled off at 12 and a half megapascals, you wouldn't get a gain in efficiency. So there must be some maxima, right? The, the concept is that there would be some best pressure to bleed off at. Is four megapascals that best pressure? Or is it slightly higher than four megapascals? Is it slightly lower than four megapascals? So that was the question that I just wanted you to um, think of. And the idea is, well, maybe this subject is about helping us determine that. And can you determine that without calculating all the state points all over again? So this is the problem that we want to solve. And I thought it would be interesting too. So a problem if you were in yesterday's lecture or you watched the recording and you were paying attention, um, I've kept the, the high and low pressures the same, the high temperature the same, and if you calculated the mass bleed off yesterday correctly, you should have got about 31% um, bleed off. So I thought, okay, let's take those same things into a closed feed water heater and see, well, does that change the thermal efficiency? What does it do to the work? Um, and so forth. And if you didn't get any further than question four, work out of the turbine, I've asked the same nine questions in solving this question. So hopefully you'll see then the further, yep, okay, this is how you do five and six and seven and eight and so forth. So um, hopefully that's interesting. I was a little surprised from the conclusion of this. Um, so this was our question from yesterday. So I've just reprised that. So if I go back, this will be our question from the day. Closed feed water heater, pressure, temperature, pressure, and so forth. This is our question from yesterday. So I've got the same bleed off pressure and so forth. So that's, um, so I've tried to recreate the same problem. Using that, you can see here we've got nine state points instead of seven. So there's a little bit more involved in a closed feed water heater system. Uh, and we can see that we've got State three is fully defined with both the pressure and the temperature. And state six and seven, so out of the condenser, you should expect a saturated liquid. That would be a standard Rankine cycle assumption. And you're also told in the question, but it, it is a, a standard assumption for the um, Rankine cycles with a closed feed water heater, that you're going to get a saturated liquid out of the heat exchanger. Right? So an open feed water heater was basically a tank that had two fluid streams coming into it and one fluid stream coming out of it. And we said that fluid stream is going to be a saturated liquid, x equals zero. As it turns out, this fluid stream was a compressed liquid and this one was a, it was superheated vapor. Although it could have been uh, a saturated mixture. But in our case, it was a superheated vapor. So that's the open feed water heater. And it's just a large open tank that has those come in. So you can imagine a tank with some water level. All right? And the steam at the top is heating it up such that the quality at the exit is zero. That's the, close, that's the open feed water heater. So that's open feed water heater. A closed feed water heater, yes. Yeah. Is it always the case that the quality would be zero on the exit? Is that That's a standard assumption. It doesn't have to be how it works. But I could see physically that might not always be the case. It doesn't have to be the case, but it is a standard assumption. And the reason it's a standard assumption is I think it gives you the best efficiency. So take, take yesterday's example, if we come back. It's a good question. So the question was, x equals zero here, is that always the case? Because it may not be the case. So if we take yesterday's question here, all right, 
and we said that the state one was a was a saturated liquid and that allowed us to calculate the mass flow A, or the mass flow fraction A. So if we nominated a mass flow fraction A instead, so say we said 20%, like which is less than 31%, right? Then what would that give us? That would give us 20% of the fluid coming through here. That would give us 80% of the fluid coming through here. This state would be colder, state one, because you've got more cold compressed liquid coming in and less superheated vapor coming in. And I feel like your condenser will lose more heat, QC, because state five will be the same and state six will be the same, but because your mass fraction is greater, you know, QC must be the difference in enthalpy's time and mass flow. I feel like you'll have more cold going out of the system. You'll have more heat going in. Don't know, complicated. But I, I sorry? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, yep, so the outtake is in the fluid area, that's true. My gut feel is that it gives you the highest level of efficiency, but you could check it. So you do yesterday's question at 20% or 40% offtake. Uh, no, you wouldn't want that to be a mixture because you'll cavitate your pump. So you could only go 31% or lower and you can see what that would do. Okay, so the efficiency. Given an exam question, we should assume it's quality of zero or it be Nah, I state it. Yeah? Yep. Here, here I say what I can fit on a slide. In the exam question, um, it's very prescriptive. I try not to assume that you know any of the standard assumptions. Oh, but like, <laughs> but I can't recreate the entire course content, right? So if I say it's, a, it's an isentropic turbine, then I assume you know what that means. Um, yeah. Um, are these systems a replacement for the reheater, or could you also put a reheater in with two turbines? You can absolutely put a reheater in with two turbines. Um, there's a... Oh, something I should have mentioned yesterday as well. One of these, that'll do. <coughs> so this is in your textbook. And is a suggested, and that's an example, right? So example 7.8, do this thing, and they, and they do it as a worked example. What's the thermal efficiency of this cycle? So you've got a couple of pumps. So you've got two pumps, so you're going to have um, three different pressures. You've got something closed water feeder, open water feeder. Um, so yes, you can have an arbitrary. But similar to the question of reheating and turbines, is there some sort of logical maximum number? I'd suggest it's probably three, gut feel. Um, An open feed water heater also does something for you that I should have mentioned yesterday and didn't, which is an open feed water heater is a great place to, oops, yep, good, um, have an air offtake. So one of the problems of running a condenser at below atmospheric pressure, actually running, uh, in this case, this whole part of the system is below atmospheric pressure is you can get air atmospheric air ingress into your system. And so it's good to have a place to take that air out of the system um, and an open feed water heater, because of its open nature, you can bleed off air quite reasonably. Good, good. Was there another question? Open feed? Good, excellent. So closed feed water heater then, so if that was the open feed water heater, a closed feed water heater then, has two fluid streams. One's going this way, and the other one's going that way. Nope. Right. And you're exchanging heat, but you're exchanging yeah, thermal energy, but not contaminating the fluid streams. So that gives you a couple of things. One is they can be at different pressures. So you can have a delta P 
between one fluid stream and the other stream. And they can also be, although they're not in this case, they can be different fluids. It's a heat exchanger. <laughs> Plate type, shell and tube type um, heat exchanger. So in this case, one of the fluid streams is four going through to seven, and the other fluid stream is one going through to two, and they're exchanging heat, but they're not mixing their fluid streams. And in this case, there are different pressures. State point four is at four megapascal, MPA and state point one and two are at what? What is state, what's the pressure of state point one and two? And eight, nine, and three? 12.5 MPA, I've, I've put it in the table as well, but. Um, yeah, okay. Good. So what's the rule for a heat exchanger? So our rule for our open feed water heater was we had two mass flows in, so it was going to be mass 1, H1, plus mass 2, H2, equals mass 3, H3. Right? That was for our open feed water heater. Now we've got two inlets and two outlets. So what's our ruling for a heat exchanger? Oh. <coughs> heat lost by one is equal to the heat gained by the other. I like that. So you're going to have some mass flow one. And you're going to have, well, in this case, so let's, let's use the symbols in the, in the thing. So we're going to have A, M dot, H4 minus H7 equals to 1 minus A, M dot, H2 minus H1. My pluses and minuses might be around the wrong way, but, right? So this is the, the heat lost by the bleed off steam, and this is the heat gain by the feed water, and they should be the same for our first law to hold true. We've neglected kinetic energy, we've neglected potential energy, um, and we've said it's steady state, steady flow, so there's no change in the system energy over time. Cool. Good. This should, this should start to feel familiar. Um, problem with this kind of repetition is for some people like, oh, I already knew that. We're done here, and others are still working it through. So based on those, so based on that description, I filled out a table with my known values. It looks to me like there's three states that have independent intrinsic properties, and that's enough to describe the fluid. And so I feel like I should be able to fill out um, these three values. And I can. Did you want? Do you want to see where I got those from? Or is everyone pretty happy with that? Happy with that? Good. Cool. Saturated liquid and superheated vapor, superheated steam. Cool. Based on that, then so from three to four to five is running through an isentropic turbine. So I'm going to take my entropy here in blue and go three, four, five. Well, that's going to copy across, so that's cool. Six to one is through an isentropic pump, so I can take my entropy across there. And seven to eight is across an isentropic pump. Everything's ideal, you haven't been given any efficiencies. Um, I'll do an example with efficiencies later. So that's just copy across. And now I feel like I've got four more state points that I've got two independent intrinsic values. So pressure and entropy, pressure and entropy, entropy, pressure entropy, pressure and entropy. So I can do calculations on that. <coughs> As it, yeah. Why is there no pressure increase over the boiler? Why is there no pressure increase over the boiler? Hmm. I know, because it feels like there should be. 
Would you, so ideally, there's no pressure change over the boiler, it's isobaric. In reality, there's a pressure drop over the boiler. Because pressure must drop in the direction of flow, because that's what makes flow happen. We're taking kinetic energies into account? Yeah, why not? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because, because there's two cases, right? If you, assume, if you assume flow is nominally constant, right, then the, tur the entrance of the turbine has to have a lower pressure than the pressure in the pipe because that's what makes the fluid go into the turbine. Flow will, yeah, but there's also a pressure gradient. Flow always pro follows a negative pressure gradient, like current always follows a negative voltage gradient. So your pressure here, <coughs> you actually, so let's just look at this section of pipe work here. This is fluid mechanics. So, you know, and let's lengthen that. Let's have that pipe laid out. So the nine is somewhere here, the three is somewhere here, and the turbine somewhere here. Okay. Pressure must do something like that. <coughs> so the pressure is the highest at the pump outlet, or at this T juncture, or where, wherever we started our graph, and is the lowest at the turbine inlet because that's how flow goes. If you think about the expansion that's happening inside the steam generator, the boiler and so forth, right? When you add heat, say this was just an open pipe and you're spewing a flame at it. That seems like a very inefficient way to heat it, but let's think about that, right? As these particles expand, and they do, they go from a compressed liquid to a superheated vapor, there's nothing that tells them to apply their pressure in the direction of flow and one could say that they are also applying their pressure back towards the pump. <coughs> and so, but the pump doesn't let them, you know, there's two pumps here, but the pumps don't let that flow go backwards, they drive flow forwards. And so what you find is that that all goes forward and it goes forward under a downward pressure gradient. So counterintuitive. The, I'm fine with this for some reason. For whatever reason, I'm fine with this. The one that stuffs me up is in the, the jet engine because I feel like you come in the compressor. So like this is your lab, the, the jet engine, the entrance to your lab, right? So you come through a compressor and then you ignite a flame. Then you go through a turbine. I feel like that flame, that increase of pressure should push back against the compressor. Cause, and it's the same thing, but for some reason this looks... I don't know. Um, but no, you do have a pressure gradient. The pressure is always reducing in actuality. And in our ideal case, we say the pressure is constant. Constant the same. I don't know if that helps. No, that makes sense. Okay, good. Yeah. <coughs> pressure, you need pressure drop to drive flow. Um, which we'll get to next session, 2600. Good. I like it. All right. Get rid of all those things. Good. So, <coughs> now we've got three, four states that we can calculate. State four, state five, you've got an entropy and a pressure. State one and state eight. I feel like you want to talk about it more. That's okay. Let me grab this. So state four and state five is you have a, you have a pressure and you have an entropy. I will just bring up the tables on one of the screens to see if we can work out what those states look like. Yeah. So if we look at state four as an example, you've got a pressure of four megapascals and a 
entropy of 6.4. So I come to my table, I say pressure of 4 megapascals. If the entropy is more than 6.07, sorry, that's too small for you guys. Well, hopefully that works. If the entropy is more than 6.07, then it must be a superheated vapor. Okay? <coughs> and then at state point 5, you've got a pressure of 12 kilopascals. And an entropy of 6.46. So you can see that it's below 8.1. So this is going to be a saturated mixture here because it's somewhere between those two values. So we're looking at state point 4 and state point 5. State point 4 then, you come over to the superheated tables because that's what we determined it was. You say, well, at an entropy of 6.46, it's somewhere between 300 degrees and 350 degrees. So it's somewhere between 2960 and 3092. And interpolating, you get the figure as per on the screen. And for state point 5, you come back here, and the entropy must be somewhere between 207 and 2600 and it's a high quality so it ends up being that so that's I haven't done the math but that's the concept behind how I got state point 4 and state point 5 it's the next level up I would propose than state point 6 and state point 7 but hopefully you're getting comfortable with using entropy as a something you can interpolate with um, potentially through quality for state point one, I didn't actually do this as an interpolation. I used my work six one equals V pressure one minus pressure six <coughs> equation for work for work for a pump. And so I looked up the specific volume of at state point six and the specific volume at state point one, and they were pretty similar. Um, they ended up being, well, the specific volume at state point one would be 1012. And the specific volume at state point, sorry, at state point six. State point one's at 12 megapascals, so you go to the compressed liquid table. And at the compressed liquid table at that relevant temperature of 50 degrees, the specific volume was somewhere about 0.11, sorry, 0 0.001008. So pretty close. 008. 4,000, oh no, sorry. 12,500 minus 12. So that gave me a work between state 6 and state 1, and that let me calculate the enthalpy at state 1. And I did the same for state 8. Everyone happy with that? Go. <laughs> Is that a better way to do it than to try and find the compressed liquid value? Six to one. The alternative is to, oops, sorry. So say we take state point one. Oops, sorry. Take state point one and take this fact that you know the pressure and the entropy. Let's call it point seven, okay? Then come across to your table and go, all right, well, between, so 12 and a half megapascals is between 10 and 15. That's halfway. That's kind of nice. Come across the entropy values, come up to the 6 range. I'm sorry, 0 0.7. Right? 
So I would say you need to interpolate between 10 and 15. What's that? The difference is about 20 there. So it's 0 0.5676 and 0 0.2. Four, sorry, 0.8244, maybe? Right, four, five? Okay, and then you need to interpolate between those created values to work out what your temperature is. I would say temperature. And then to get enthalpy, you do the same interpolation between those two to get values at 12 megapascals, 12 and a half megapascals, and then interpolate on the temperature you found to get the new enthalpy value. So you're probably doing six interpolations uh, to get a figure that would be, so let's look at di the difference between six and one, all right? So this is about 13 kilojoules per kilogram, all right? You're probably going to find it's between 11 and 15 using the interpolation. So it might be up to 10, 15, 20% out by doing interpolation. But in the scheme of, for example, the work through the turbine, which is between state point three and state point five, which is 1300, um, you know, the work in the pump is 1% of the work of the turbine. If the work in the pump is out by a bit, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So I find that calculation easier to do. I think it's, a, it's one worth keeping in your pocket. Uh, I don't think it's a formula I gave on the formula sheet, but you've looked at the formula sheet. Um, if you didn't have that, then you could interpolate um, the compressed liquid. They weren't very different. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So they were, when I specifically designed for the exam marking criteria for last year. I specifically designed a tolerance in all the questions, and generally the tolerance was 1%. And for this question, the tolerance was 5%. Because it's fine. But then, when you calculated the network of the cycle, which you could have done by doing turbine work minus pump work, that was 1% again. And your turbine work so out blew your pump work that even if your pump work was off by a factor of two, you'd still be within tolerance on the, on the network. So, because there's two different ways to calculate it, just, I'd just tolerance it out and let it go. Good. So that's what I did for... Six to one, the two pumps, six to one and seven to eight. Uh, now the question is, what happens then to state point two? And is this realistic? Because I thought, I also did the temperatures for state point seven and state point two. And I guess to some level state point four, because there's some limit on the hottest output you can get out of a heat exchanger and the hottest you can get out of a heat exchanger is the hottest that the incoming fluid right so state point you can't get state point two to be hotter than state point four so I wanted to make sure that I was asking the question reasonably so I calculated some temperatures as well it's probably worth having a go at calculating state point two. So have you got a pen and paper? Because that's the, oh, we've got time. All right, here's the problem. I'll show it to you and then I know that no one will look at it again. And that's the problem. Because you just said, you know, in the last 24 hours, um, you're not taking the opportunity to look. But, what this had to take into account was the enthalpy loss between state point four and state point seven and the enthalpy gain between state point one and state point two. And the difference in mass flows, so you've got two different mass flows. You've got 68% of your fluid coming through there and you've got 32% of your fluid coming through there. And you end up finding the Enthalpy at state point two. Now you know your mass fraction between the flow coming in from two and the flow coming in from eight. 
and you know the enthalpies at state point 2 and 8, which are actually very similar. And we can mix those together to give us an enthalpy of state point 9, and the temperature is around 251, 252, going into the steam generator. <coughs> so these are the types of questions that you would be asked for such a, for such a problem. There are a similar nine questions as the ones yesterday, um, except that I think calculating the enthalpy at state point two and nine is a reasonable question in its own right. Um, and the interesting thing, if you looked at the if you looked at the solutions from yesterday, so that's given, that's fine. You can calculate those. The interesting thing, if you look at the difference between this problem and the one yesterday, I think if you do a side-by-side -side comparison, is that the heat into the steam generator is the same within 1%. The heat out of the condenser is exactly the same because state point 0.5 and 6 are the same as yesterday's state points through the condenser. The total work of the turbine comes out to be the same. The pump work is higher. And I think that comes down to the fluid is less dense through pump one, but it's within margin of error to be the same. The network turns out to be the same. Yesterday's cycle is 86.6 megawatt. I've got an error in my calculations that gives me two slightly different values, <clears throat> but they're around the 86.6. The thermal efficiency ends up being the same. All these calcs are given for yesterday as well. Um, and the TS diagram, which hopefully, anyway, if you look at yesterday's lecture notes, looks the same. So I thought that was interesting. If I just go back to thermal efficiency, I thought that was interesting. Initially, I was surprised because what I wanted to do was a side-by-side -side comparison, open feed water heater, closed feed water heater, and show, oh, this is the material difference that having a closed feed water heater provides. But I ended up getting the same answer, or close enough, across the board, the same answer. So why would you use a closed feed water heater, or what have I not taken into account? Why would it be the same? What could we change? <coughs> the, the only thought that I had on that regard was that if this was an open system, all right, then the pressure that we took off state point four at defined the mass flow. And the fact that we'd assumed that the outlet was um, a compressed liquid, right? So we only had to define the pressure of state point four, and that gave us then our mass flow fraction through the feed water heater. With a closed feed water heater, you've got another lever to pull. So you can change the pressure of four up, if you like, so from four megapascals, five megapascals, and so forth, um, close up to 12, or you can change it down. And then within some limits of tolerance, you can manipulate your mass fraction. Notice the question had to nominate a mass fraction this time. I said 31.5% goes through. So I recreated the open feed water system, but I could now manipulate that over a much greater range, I think. So I think I could increase it, whereas in the open feed water I couldn't, because then I'd get, um, I'd blow my pump out, or I could decrease it. So I think it just gives you another lever to pull to try and manipulate um, things like thermal efficiency. I had, a, um, I had a master's by coursework student who I asked to work on the problem of generating a model. Sorry, I'll throw that out. I asked him to work on generating a model that would kind of simulate a system and have a couple of sliders and let you manipulate the different variables and see what the, what the effect on the output was. And particularly, I think, what's really hard to get at is what is the optimal? What is the optimal pressure? What is the optimal bleed rate? Um, because doing these analysis take a while. Like it, takes, you know, it takes me an hour <coughs> to do something like this with an Excel sheet in front of me. So it's not, these aren't trivial things. Um, he tried for a while and then went AWOL. So I haven't seen him for like six months. So 
apparently the problem was more complicated than I thought. But if someone was interested in doing that, I was thinking on the way here, I think it's worth five course marks extra credit. If you thought to, and that's a bit unfair, right? Because it was worth a whole master's thesis. So maybe five course marks isn't, isn't a worthy, um, isn't enough. But to generate just a model of something a little bit more complicated than a simple ranking cycle, for example, or a Brayton cycle with reheat or re regeneration or so forth, um, and know, well, what is, the, what is the lever that you can pull and what's the optimal efficiency coming out of that? And that's where this, <coughs> this last question is kind of coming out. Does a higher open feed water, oh, sorry, this is closed feed water, copy and paste from yesterday, obviously, Close feed water heat of pressure increase, improve or decrease the thermal efficiency. And then the other one is, does an in, increased A, what does that do? Does it increase bleed mass fraction? What does that do to the thermal efficiency of the cycle? Because I think that's a question that is worth answering and it's, it's more complex than you can trivially answer. That was what I had. <coughs> is that the pressure four or pressure one? Pressure one is defined by the pressure in the steam generator. So you notice we've only got the outlet of pump one is whatever your steam generator is operating at. So the implication is that it's the pressure at point four. Yep. So it's the bleed off pressure. Closed would be more expensive. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, an open feed water heater would be a a pressure vessel with a few nozzles. A closed feed water heater would be a pressure vessel with a header at both ends and tubes running through it potentially if it's a shell and tube. <clears throat> we'll do heat exchange and design in thirty six ten. Yeah. Cool. All right, thanks guys, I will see you next week.